just easier. So what I want to do is I want to go through one by one each one of these statements, these quotes that is here being made fun of and show how it's either taken out of context or totally misunderstood or, or just not taken with the right seriousness that something from the Torah should be taken yet. And, 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 and just to show how, as humorous as this is, it's not informative. It's funny, as it says in the introduction, but it's not informative. It's, uh, it's cute sarcasm, but, it, but it's not intelligent if you actually look into these things. And to, to take a quote from the Torah and quote it out of context, in translation, out of the blue, you're never going to understand what it means. And, and it would be very easy to list hundreds more such quotes and show how they make no sense whatsoever. Because that, the nature of Torah is that it needs interpretation, it needs explanation. Now, the Jewish people have studied Torah now for over 3,000 years. And there is not a verse, not a word, nothing in the Torah that we have not investigated, questioned, asked, and looked into to understand it deeply. There's no question, there's no weird thing in the Torah that we haven't already looked at and dealt with and moved on from. So for, for a non-Jew or, or a less educated Jew to read through these things, it's a bit of, bit of a shock. You know, you can sell your daughter as a slave. Like, th- things that, that would take you by surprise. But for somebody who learns, learns the Torah, who, know, who knows it, is familiar with it, like we do every week, we learn the parasha, we, we look, look at it in depth. So these things are not going to worry us They're, because they've, they've all been explained, they've all been dealt with. But are you saying that the written Torah is, I wouldn't say incomplete, but without the oral Torah is not easily understood? Absolutely, it's a closed book. You cannot understand anything in the written Torah without the oral Torah. I'll give you a very simple example. Uh, in the written Torah it says you should write them on the doorposts of your houses. <coughs> write what? Where? How? With what? It doesn't say anything. You write them on the doorposts of your houses. We know that means a mezuzah. Of course it means a mezuzah. But one second, how did you get a scroll from that? It says write them on the doorposts of your house. You should be graffitiing your house with something. And what? It just says with them. There's no way you can understand what that means without the oral Torah that tells you them is referring to the laws that are mentioned right there in that paragraph. Writing them is on a scroll, on, on, on the doorpost that explains where and how. The, all the details are put there. There's no way you can understand it. Or remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. What does that mean? How do you remember a day? How do you keep it holy? What does holy mean? You know, do not work on, on the Sabbath. Six days you should work, on the seventh day you should rest. What's work? Without defining these things, it, it has no meaning. It's meaningless. There's nothing in the Torah that makes any sense without the oral tradition. It, it's not possible to approach any of it. And so... For a, for a non-Jew reading the translation of the Bible, they, they don't have access to the oral tradition, so they have to just take it face value, literally. And of course, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't have any context. But, but we who do have the oral tradition, we have the background to all these things. And so, you know, it, 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 if it's like going into an area where you're not an expertise, you don't have all the information. If you would just open a, a, a medical textbook that describes brain surgery, and you take a line out of it and say, well, this is ridiculous, how could you do this? You know, like, well, what do you know about brain surgery? What are, you, what are you taking a line and thinking that you're an expert? You don't have a clue what you're talking about. So here as well, just, just plunk, plucking a line out of Leviticus and saying, look how ridiculous this is, without their background, of course it makes no sense. So, so let's, let's have a look and, and see how we can actually make sense out of these things. The very first one, the first attack that he makes is on the concept of sacrifice. And there it says that um, his question was, when I burn a bull on the altar as a sacrifice, I know it creates a pleasing odor for the Lord, as it says in Leviticus 1.9. Problem is my neighbors. They claim the odor is not pleasing to them. So should I smite them? Okay. So the should I smite them bit, is, that's just a throwaway line. That's just like quoting, you know, other things get the death penalty, so should, should we smite people who don't like the smell of sacrifice? That's not based on anything in the Torah. But what is based on a verse is that the, the, the odor is pleasing for God. Reich Nechayach Hashem in Hebrew, it says about sacrifices that this is a pleasing odor for God. Is that talking about the actual carbon or the actual sum on the carbon? The, the, the talking about the sacrifices. The, the, the burning of the sacrifices is a pleasing odor to God. Um, not just for the sum, not just the, the, uh, the incense, which is, smells nice, yeah. even the, the, the doing of the sacrifice. So, 
So, you have to admit, it sounds pretty weird that God gets pleasure out of your meat being uh, burnt on the, on the altar like this bull or the sacrifice where God, God enjoys the smell. It, it sounds almost paganistic and idolatrous to say such a thing. So what, is it, what does it really mean? So the whole sacrificial thing has to be, again, put into context. What was this sacrificial service? What was it all about? The idea of bringing an animal to the altar was a, was a, a meditation. The whole thing was a, a visualization of something that was, should have been going on within yourself. The animal represents your inner animal, the animal part of your personality. And that's, the, that's the, reason, the reason why we sin, we do the wrong thing, is because we have an animalistic, instinctive, wild side to our personality. Bringing a sacrifice was taking your animal and bringing it to the altar of God, burning it up for God, meaning trying to transform your inner personality to be elevated, to be refined. And so the actual sacrificial part of it, the, the, the physical part of it, was all like a pantomime, it was a show, it was, it was a play in front of you of what should be happening to yourself. And this would be done by, you'd, you'd separate the animal, and you would, before giving it to the, the altar, you would put your hands on its shoulders and do what's called smicha, where you'd lean on it and look it in the eye. And at that moment, you would contemplate the fact that this animal is a depiction of a part of my personality, the animalistic side of me that has caused me to do the wrong thing. Who would do that? So that's only a person bringing the sacrifice. That's, uh-huh. only, that's only for a chattis. What about a tommy, the oil, uh, this and that? Okay, well, uh, here I'm giving an example of when you, you know, he's saying that he, he's, he's bringing a sacrifice. There are other daily sacrifices. But, but here I'm saying specifically when you're bringing your sacrifice, this is, this is what you'd be doing. And you would contemplate on this idea that this animal represents your animal. And as it would be burnt on the altar, it, it, would, be, it would move you to try and elevate, refine, and change your, your inner self. And the fact that it's possible to refine our lowly urges, our lowly personality, there's nothing that gives God more pleasure than that. The fact that a human being can transform themselves, this is why God created the world. The, the idea that we have a soul and our soul wants to serve God, that's, that's not so surprising. But what about your animal? Can you change your animal? Turning your animal around to serve God, to come on the altar, that's what gives God pleasure because it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a new idea. It's something that's novel. It's a, it's a transformation. It's a change. It's an innovation. Um, so, so that's what it means in the Torah when it says that it's a pleasant smell for, for God. The way the Talmud puts it is, what's the pleasure? That I have told the people to do something and they've, they've done what I want. They've gone against their own will and they've come to align themselves with my will. You have to also remember, animals back then, to, have, to own an animal, that was your livelihood. That was, that was what you depended upon. Like an animal was you know, like your car today. And so taking your animal, bring it to, to, the, to the altar to be burnt up, was a major thing. It was a sacrifice. <laughs> so we call it a sacrifice. You take the yeah, you, yeah would, you, would you, because of your sins, take your murk and, and burn it in the, in the altar? It was a major thing. Was so it also some kind of uh, payment? Because like, instead of giving money, you're giving your animals, which is part of the payment. Like, yeah, yeah, that's right. It was, it was your. You're paying, like, Europe, for example, giving tzedakah, or Europe, mm-hmm. or... Yeah. Is that what's going to the Yeah, yeah, it was. Some songs there was that. So, so it's, it's a much more sophisticated process than just a barbecue of animals. And it's not that, <coughs> that God enjoys the smell of a barbecue, <coughs> and that's what, that's what it means, the pleasant odor to God. What it, what it means is that there's actually an inner process going on. The, the fact that you broke yourself to bring your animal and you met, had this meditation of thinking of what this animal represents within yourself, that transformation and change, that's what makes it a pleasant odor for God. And the neighbors, there were no neighbors in the temple. This was not something that you could do in your garden. You know, he makes it sound like you know, altar, you've made it, make an altar in your garden and bring up a sacrifice. Yeah, but then why, why doesn't it say pleasant uh, what? Pleasant avoda? Why specifically an odor? Because that's a that's a like byproduct of the action. The odor is a byproduct of the action. Yeah. What, what when you burn when you bur- burn an animal? So what what you're doing is you're taking something very coarse and physical, an animal, a big rough bull, yeah. and by burning it, you're, you're you're literally in a physical way transforming it into a mist, into 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 smoke. 
and that that's the process we're talking about taking your coarse lowly vulgar personality and refining it into something that's pleasant and fine that's that's the exact process so wasn't there a time in history that you were were allowed to uh, make uh, like Ms. Bayak that you, your bummer. before before the the temple was consecrated there were, you could have a bummer which was a, a private altar there was such a thing but then once the Mishkan was built and then once the Mishkan Shiloh was built when, when there was a right. when there was a place of sacrifice then, then you couldn't so when you, when you could have the Bama in, the, in your backyard technically there wouldn't be neighbors <laughs> right but he, here he's trying to say he's trying to apply to, to today how, you, how do you apply these rules well, to, today you can't bring a sacrifice if you could bring a sacrifice the only place is in, yeah. in the temple yeah, right. and and the neighbors are going to complain about the smell yeah, of a so you know, we do barbecues all the time. You know, you know the neighbors don't complain about the smell of your of the meat. So, so that that's just a, a bit of a, a red herring. But um, so, so again, this is just an example of where, of course, taking taking it out of context that God enjoys the pleasant smell of a bull burning, like it sounds ridiculous. But when you look into into the depth of it, there's actually a meaning to it. There's there's, there's something something more.